Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to a, another edition of Curator Conversations. My name is Eric Wright. I'm the Education Specialist here at the museum, and I just want to thank everybody for taking their lunch hour, uh, no matter where you're at today, and spending it with us and, and listening to uh, a little bit about Wisconsin history and uh, also what we uh, have here available at the museum, which is kind of what we're going to talk about today. Um, today's discussion topic is behind the, seat, behind the scenes of the Harold F. Schmidt's art exhibit uh, that we currently have downstairs. Uh, it's unfortunate uh, that nobody can come in and see it right now, uh, but we are working our best to change that and hopefully we'll be able to open our doors soon uh, so people can come in and look at that. Um, this curator conversation uh, is going to be hosted by Brittany Strobel, who is the processing archivist here at the museum, and by Yvette Pino, who is the traveling art exhibit coordinator uh, with the museum as well. Uh, but before we uh, bring them on and, and get them started, I just want to uh, mention a couple things. Uh, first of all, I once again would like to say uh, thank you very much to the Wisconsin Veterans Museum Foundation uh, for their continued support in these virtual programs that we do and for being able to keep them free to the public and having everybody uh, have a chance to participate um, in the things that are going on here at the museum and also our virtual discussions that we have. So thank you very much to the foundation and also to its executive director, uh, Jennifer Carlson. You guys do a fantastic job over there. Um, and once again, we do greatly appreciate you keeping these events free for the public and free for us to put out there uh, to uh, the general audience at large. Um, as we're going through the discussion today, uh, we certainly welcome questions and we're kind of, we're, we're gonna try to do this a little differently today. Instead of waiting for all the questions at the end, um, we're gonna let Brittany and Yvette answer questions as we go along, um, at least the best that we can. So if you do have any questions, please uh, submit those questions through chat and either I will bring them up um, at a good stopping point uh, as they're speaking, or they'll notice uh, that they have some good questions in chat and they'll bring those questions up as well. But please, chat feature, to submit those questions. Um, I think that is it. So like I said, the curator's conversation today is gonna to be about the behind the scenes uh, of the Harold F. Schmidt's art exhibit. Uh, and what Brittany and Yvette are gonna be talking about today is sort of the discovery process um, and all the research that they did and what they found out as they were doing this research and how they wanted to set up the exhibit, how that research kind of drove them to uh, their certain conclusions. Um, and how they wanted to set this up. Uh, so that's what they're gonna be speaking about today, if you keep that in mind as we go along. Uh, and I'm not gonna talk for any longer. I'm gonna turn this over to Brittany and Yvette. Uh, ladies, uh, we are welcome, or we're glad to hear uh, about all that you guys uh, researched and developed as you're doing this exhibit. So please take it away. Thanks so much, Eric. Um, I really appreciate the intro. Um, and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I will say um, this has been a labor of love working on the Harold Schmitz exhibit. Uh, it was a two year process of research and development for the exhibit. And we're happy that there's now a virtual walkthrough. So those of you that haven't had a chance to visit the exhibit can still look at Harold's beautiful artwork online until the day uh, when it's safe for us to resume um, operations at the museum. Um, so I just wanted to start out with a couple of thank yous. Uh, thank you to, of course, to our foundation for providing us this platform, but also uh, a big thanks to Linda Devitt, who is Harold Schmitz's daughter, and her husband, Patrick, who opened their doors to me on multiple occasions throughout the development process to give me a more in-depth view of Harold's life, but also I got to see drawings from the point when he was a child um, to the day, to days leading up before um, he died. So I'm eternally grateful for that. Um, I'll say it again. I've said it before and I'll say it again. I really do appreciate uh, the hospitality you showed me um, during this process. Um, and also a thanks to the Wisconsin Veterans Museum. You know, I came back to the museum in 2017 to work on traveling art exhibits and this opportunity was presented to me um, as a, you know, a, a, a way in which I could look at the drawings and see what we could do with them. And I'll get into that in more detail in a few minutes. But um, they presented me with an opportunity for a curatorial endeavor that I was not expecting. And it was really 
an honor to be able to take this to the next steps, which means uh, a full exhibit within our temporary gallery. So I'm really grateful for that. I'd also like to uh, reintroduce uh, Brittany Strobel, who I think was my partner in crime in all of this. Uh, I, I, my co-curator, um, our processing archivist, that with her amazing research capabilities and sort of inquisitive mind really prompted me to think about what I was looking at in a different way and really challenged me to investigate further than what is just on the surface. Um, so Brittany, if you want to join in with me and talk a little bit about, um, you know, anything you want to say before we get started into the in-depth conversations. Uh, thank you for the introduction of it. Um, I don't know if I can be credited with your inquisitive mind. I think you really led this exhibit um, as far as it's gone. Um, truly, it was it was a joy to get to know Harold. I think when we talked about this the first time, just you and I, we talked about how, you know, we had a photographic scrapbook, an art scrapbook, and then a handful of papers, some of which were letters. Um, and truly, diving into those couple of things that we had, the wealth of knowledge that was in that small amount of, um, of material. It's really, it's really been great to see it turned into an exhibit. It's, it's beautiful, which is all to your credit. Wow, thank you. Um, I think we are, I think both of us would agree that the, the end credit ultimately goes to Harold. We, Brittany and I both feel, um, this is one thing I feel confident in speaking for both of us, we felt like we had this kindred spirit relationship with Harold by the time the process was over. Um, and the picture that's in my, you know, virtual background here is actually the 955th who Harold served with. And over my, if you're looking at the screen, it would be my left shoulder. Um, Harold is the very back person in there. And I feel like he's watching over me um, during this presentation. So, uh, this is going to be, you know, the, the the process was really fun getting to know him as a person, not just as a an artist and not just as an, an a soldier. So um, as we begin, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and get to um, some images just so we have some reference images to start with. Um, so how did this all begin? How did this exhibit begin? What you're looking at right here on the screen is a scrapbook and it's Harold's scrapbook um, and a way in which he preserved his drawings that he made. These drawings uh, were all made dated 1942 to 1945. So we have a multi-year deployment overseas with Harold. And I bring this up because how did this exhibit happen? We have this scrapbook and you know, I said a few minutes ago, this exhibit was presented to me as an opportunity to curate this. And really what it was, was we have this new collection, new, newer, it was donated to the museum in 2013. And I was told, take a look at these drawings, see what you can do with them. What, how would you curate an exhibit? Could you curate an exhibit? And so I went and I, you know, of course, embraced the idea. Um, and what I had were scanned versions of the scrapbook. So I had these beautiful drawings that I went through, similarly what, to what I'm doing right now, just kind of, I did take more time obviously with each drawing, but my initial run through was, okay, I see landscapes. I know he served in the South Pacific. I see some military, um, you know, items and articles, but really, there wasn't a lot for me to go off of in terms of finding out who Harold was or what the behind the scenes were of these drawings. So if we go back, um, that was my initial response. I went to Brittany because I only had the scanned images and I said, can you give me a little bit more background about this? And, you know, that's when she identified that this, in fact, is what sort of what the collection is. I mean, we have more to the collection in terms of photographs. I'll let Brittany talk about that. But really what you're looking at right now is where we started. So Brittany, I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit about what we're looking at right here. Sure, this is Harold's art scrapbook. 
So when I came to it, it had been dismantled by a conservationist, um, conservator. And really what you're looking at is after I'm done working with it, you can see some white kind of clearish paper sticking out of the yellow paper um, that the scrapbook is made of. So after his service at some time, Harold made a scrapbook and he individually matted every single piece you see. Um, and if you've had the chance to be in our exhibit, you should pretty much see a one-to-one -one of how he matted things in his scrapbook with a couple of exceptions. There's some things that we wanted people to see that you couldn't see in the scrapbook. But Harold very lovingly created mat work in this scrapbook and I can't tell you how difficult it must have been for him because he cut individual windows and there's not a miscut anywhere in the scrapbook. So what I did was I put it back together for Harold. He had taped the drawings in and we had had a conservator take the drawings out so that the tape wouldn't damage them. Um, and then I reconstructed it using photo corners and putting in some interleaving paper so that the beautiful artwork, mostly the charcoal, wouldn't rub off on the pages that it faced. So this was my first real dive into his collection was taking out the scrapbook, realizing it had been partially dismantled and really wanting Harold's care for his work and the way he wanted his work to be seen and experienced to be respected and to, as much as we can, keep it the way that he had designed it to be seen. Yeah, and I think that's definitely one of the considerations we had. Maybe it, it kind of was this overarching umbrella throughout our whole process when we're considering gallery layout and exhibit design. Um, you know, normally I, I, I do have to start with saying um, what we did with Harold's artwork essentially was in the art world known as a solo show. Um, Harold was a practicing artist, but he was working in the publishing industry. So he was a printmaker and, and did, um, you know, printed publication um, and illustration work. And so his artwork was, he was a very skilled artist, but he was not an exhibiting artist. So um, the ability to give him a solo show was pretty special, and it's pretty unique at our museum as well. And I'm not saying that we won't ever do this again, but it's rare that we would do a solo exhibit of just one veteran's experience because we like to have a diversity of voices in our temporary exhibits and in all of our exhibits. Um, but there was a specific reason why uh, Harold's work was able to be shown in this way. Number one, it's pretty extensive, the amount of drawings we have. It's a, a pretty big collection with drawings. We also have a ton of photographs in the scrapbook. We have uh, printed publication material that the 955th Topographic Engineers uh, did, and that was Harold's unit. Um, and we, so we had a lot of material that we could hold, with, that could take space in a gallery. And the reason was, um, we, our collection at the time was getting ready to move from our current location on Capitol Square to the new state archival preservation facility uh, up the street. So in an effort to get us a new exhibit at the museum without putting additional strain on our collection staff and on our collection, it was a really great opportunity to exhibit this beautiful body of work that perhaps wouldn't have been able to see uh, the light of day in a full exhibit any other time. We would have likely used Harold's artwork in an exhibit uh, as one entity of a larger exhibit. So when we think about the scrapbook, Brittany and I had this conversation that the scrapbook itself could have been one item showcased in a much bigger exhibit with multiple stories in it, which is a lot of the way it, uh, military artwork as is shown as this scrapbook. And when you enter the exhibit, you do see the scrapbook on display. And that was a very, uh, a very specific choice that we made. Um, Brittany, I don't know if you have anything to add to that in terms of what we considered when we were putting that, um, that scrapbook as the main focal point. There's two main focal points upon entry into the exhibit, the scrapbook and the lighthouse, which I'll get into in just a second. I think for, I think for both of us, it was important that everyone enter Harold's world the way we did, which was through the scrapbook. So we had to be very intentional with how we arranged the galleries so that when you entered this exhibit, the first thing you truly came to was Harold's scrapbook. Not only were you seeing his wonderful art, you were seeing it the way that he had intended it to be seen. 
Right. Yeah, I mean, I think that we definitely wanted to highlight that. We also wanted to highlight exactly what Brittany talked about, which was the the, the way he framed out each piece and, and show the care. The image we selected, uh, many people think is a self-portrait. It actually is not. And we discovered that through a lot of research in the letters. Um, Harold, in the 955th, a little background about the 955th, they were topographical engineers, which meant they made maps. And they made maps from scrap, uh, scratch based off of aerial reconnaissance photography. Um, and there's a very extensive process that goes behind that. But the men that were recruited to fill these ranks were artists. And they were artists from across the country with very similar experiences and backgrounds. Uh, so we see this, this is one of the artist, artists, I believe this is Anderson. We, we were able to figure out who these characters were based off of letters and also the photographs of the unit where we were able to look at who was serving alongside Harold and by their physique and their, and their demeanor. This one we know is George Logan because he specifically talks about George Logan, a buddy of his, in one of the letters, and George had a mustache, so it was very, it was very we knew that right away when we were looking at this drawing. Uh, he's out in the field, so all of these artists, there was moments where they were, they had time to draw. Harold really, I think, was the most skilled out of all of his colleagues. We have um, drawings from the art show that they did, also in a booklet called the Anabasis, which was essentially their yearbook uh, for their time overseas. And this was an artist invitational that the 955th put on in the officers club that they built themselves, I will say. Um, the enlisted men built the officers club and then exhibited in it and then finally built the uh, enlisted men's club lit toward the very end of their tour. Uh, but a lot of the artists were using watercolor and we see them using watercolors in some of the photographs of them and their skill these the black and white image doesn't do these justice we do see some of the color renderings in the anabasis but they're they are much more of a loose form a lot a little bit more of a impressionist style and harold was very precise in his details um so that's a little bit of the background of why uh this exhibit happened I want to kind of give you like the steps in which we took to get to where the, what the end result was. And Harold's scrapbook led us in the direction we needed to because he placed the drawings and whether he did this intentionally, I'm not sure. It seems like Harold is a very meticulous, organized, uh, you know, artist and craftsman. So he took us uh, in a logical format chronologically from his experience and so the drawings took us in a they provided a timeline for us to follow so that we could understand where he was serving when he was serving places that were around him and what Brittany and I like to talk about is he offered us these breadcrumbs these clues and when I first looked at the artwork I was drawn to the colors. Um, I'm not, I've, I've never been like really drawn to landscapes before. That has since changed since studying Harold's artwork, but the colors were so vibrant and his hand is such a skilled hand with soft marks, uh, but there's a lot of detail in each one of these drawings. Um, and the clues that we get helped me break down a lot of information that I needed that was on that surface level that I needed to get me to the next level to understand what I was looking at and why it was important. And Brittany, do you, can you give us an overview a little bit of those, of those clues as well? You know, the clues that Harold provided were mostly in the dates and then mm -hmm. if he titled his works. Um, something that Yvette was able to do was look at the, the handful of letters that we have and kind of match up drawings with letters. Um, and these letters were written to L or Eleanor, who he would later marry. And Yvette was able to construct a timeline looking just at, you know, here's all of his art, here are all the dates, here are the letters, here's what he talks about. And then looking at when he must have been really, really busy making maps because he didn't do any drawing that we know of. 
So when we were looking at these things, Yvette's highlighted here, the title of this work is The Cathedral at Numia, New Caledonia. Mm -hmm. And then Yvette was able to, are you going to go to the, the, the photo yeah. next? Oh, I can go to the photo. Yeah, for sure. So this is a photo of that cathedral right alongside the drawing that um, the Harold did. Yeah, and it was pretty amazing that because he he dated the drawings but also titled a few of them, he didn't title all of them, he was able to give me a location. He made it pretty easy for me. Um, the first thing I did before I even got into the library was Google Inumia New Caledonia, Google Cathedral New Caledonia, and really images like the one on the right uh, came up and what this showed me was how impressive his skill was at depicting architecture. And that was a clue that led us to ask Linda some questions. And when I started talking to Linda, his daughter, for the first couple times, uh, going over his scrapbooks from a younger age, I came to understand that when Harold was in high school, he loved to draw architecture and he was so good at it that he was asked by a local architect firm in Milwaukee to draw the 3D renderings of their model homes from blueprints. So for, he would take a blueprint and was able to render the exterior um, three-dimensional design. And then those drawings were published in the, in the Sunday newspaper each week for, I believe it was Dwyer Architects to... Uh, sell their homes and this was at you know high school age 15 16 years old so pretty skilled hand uh in terms of architecture and that just didn't leave him he loved to draw architecture cars uh airplanes and we see that in the exhibit and we we were able to get some of his drawings from his teenage years and then compare them to the drawings he was making in the military uh the this this cathedral also is featured in photographs from Harold's collection. I'm not sure if Harold photographed these. I think he had a photographer on staff with him that they took a lot of photographs and because they were printmakers he was able to have a lot of prints of these beautiful photographs. So that was something we did research and, and photography was not something that was in Harold's purview so we didn't track down or verify whether or not he photographed these but they were definitely in his scrapbook. Um, but when you start looking at the photo, the photography in his collection and then comparing them to his drawings, it's amazing how much they match up. Um, this is another kind of breadcrumb that Harold lent, uh, lent us. Uh, this is the in Espiritu Santo. Actually, this one's still in New Caledonia. Uh, they, they have a, a lot of Catholic missions out there. So this is the Virgin Mary statue out there. But we started seeing this photography, his drawings of the churches and the cathedrals. There's multiple drawings of churches. So we have the cathedral. We have it from this angle. We also have this Catholic church. And then we have this building, which he refers to uh, a place of worship for the natives. And so there was this reoccurring theme of religion and faith and religious structures that made me want to know more about Harold, whether he was a religious man, which led me to uh, something that didn't make it into the exhibit. But after Harold returned from the war, he went on to return to his job in publishing at um, Hammersmith Courtmire Publishing, but then left there shortly after to work as an art director at Northwestern Publishing. And Northwestern Publishing is a publisher for uh, Lutheran-based books and materials. And, and he also did drawings for his local Lutheran church. So Harold is a man of faith. But, you know, after having conversations with his daughter and investigating into his life a little bit more, it wasn't like this was this, you know, dominating uh, storyline in his life, but it was very much present in what he viewed and how he viewed his surroundings and uh, also just how he approached treating 
uh, people in general throughout his life. So, Brittany, do you want to touch base on the churches and some of the, the research that we did going into that? Sure. Um, really, you led the way on a lot of this research. I, I was mostly following you down this rabbit hole, but this, <laughs> this church you were able to find uh, still standing. And yeah. we were able to look at it and really wanted to include it right at the start of the show because it showed that Harold was using whatever he had on hand. Right. And at this moment, it was army stationery and some pencils. And as you're looking at these um, scams today, please know that the artwork itself is far richer than we could ever capture. We scanned these at the highest possible resolution for every image, and none of it holds up to the true beauty and precision in his actual work. So I encourage you, when we can get back to the museum, to either make, um, make a stop to see the show or make an appointment to see the scrapbook for yourself so you can really experience these for yourself. I was always really drawn to the, what Harold referred to as the place of worship for the natives, the, the red church um, structure. Oh, that has you. always been my favorite piece in the show. Um, from the moment I opened his scrapbook, this has always been my favorite drawing of his. The, care with the architecture and the the softness of the trees and the sky and the the landscape around that that church this has always been my favorite piece in the entire collection i'm glad you brought that up because that was one of the things we talked about we wanted to you know talk about our favorite drawing which is really hard after spending so much time um, i have a couple of favorites myself and those are reflected in the exhibit too because i had one of them blown up in super large scale. Uh, this one, of course, if you if you remember as you're walking through the exhibit, this is eight feet tall by, uh, it's actually eight feet wide by 10 feet tall. Uh, and the reason I love this one so much is, and, and when we had it framed, we left the spiral uh, showing from the sketchbook. And uh, remind me, Brittany, not to forget to talk about the sketchbook, but the, the spiral showing uh, because this caliber of drawing is so incredibly rich with detail. I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. The line work and this little figure down here is probably a half, maybe a half inch. Like if you're thinking about scale, this figure is maybe a half inch. And, and, and Harold would have been drawing these in plein air out in the field or maybe from his cot. Um, so to be able to get that richness in detail is just extraordinary. And I found this picture from a blog post uh, from this is the area in which Harold would have been drawing. And this is, uh, I, I'll put the link to the blog post on the next slide, but this gives you an idea of how he was able to get the colors in these drawings. This is New Caledonia today. So you see the cathedral there. Harold mentions in one of his letters, I was really intrigued by the clouds. He mentions it in his oral history too. He was fascinated by the clouds. And when you look at this shot, you can't help but say, wow, yeah, I would have been too. And he, he the clouds he drew look like these clouds. Uh, it was pretty spectacular. And then this image gives you a little bit more of an idea of the location of where he was drawing from. And it is quite beautiful. Um, and then that leads me back to my second drawing, which by the time Harold finishes his three years overseas, the drawings at the very beginning, I mentioned he did things chronologically. So you see the cathedral, you see the landscapes. These are, of course, are photographs. Um, but three years in, in the same area, he really doesn't want to draw that stuff anymore. So he starts turning to portraits. And portraits is usually what I'm drawn to. And so this is probably the, the drawing that caught my eye from the very beginning, just scanning through the sketchbook. By the time I got to this drawing, I was like, wow, this is pretty amazing. Um, the softness of the line again. But I pulled up on the next screen just a little bit of detail. This, all that line work, there is some pixelation from the digital, but it's not that's not pixelation. What that is, is 
the colored pencil is catching the tooth of the paper on the sketchbook, but then it's just a series of line work of the pencil over and over and in the softness of his hand and the way he used colors to create depth is something that takes many artists years and years and years to achieve. And Harold was a printmaker, so he knew how to use color to his advantage by layering it. But if anybody that has ever drawn with layers of colors knows, if you don't know how to do it correctly, you'll create what's essentially mud. Everything will be brown. Um, you have to know what colors to mix and how. And this is colored pencil. One of the things, my biggest question from day one was, what medium did he use and why did he use it? And I do this because most of you guys know I'm an army veteran and I'm an artist. So as a deployed soldier, I knew I constantly was drawing in the field because that's what artists do, right? It, it's your passion. You don't stop just because you're in another location. The colored pencil, what I'm finding as I investigate uh, artists who were in service, in military service specifically, they used whatever materials they had available to them. In his oral history, he was asked, um, and I want to talk about the oral history in a second too, he was asked, why would you use colored pencils? And he said, because that's what I had available to me. It was the most practical medium, which Brittany and I love to talk about Harold's letters and his oral history because the title of the exhibit came from that, In My Spare Moments, is what he said in his letter. I had found some time to draw in my spare moments. But I went through a series of titles. Most Practical Medium was one, and Advantageous Location was another one. Uh, lots of interesting things to draw out here. Uh, but the colored pencil was like, okay, so did he take a kit of colored pencils? What kind of colored pencils would he, would, have, would, it, would he have had while he was overseas? And I did all of this research about the types of color pencils he would have used at the Leighton School of Art. He studied uh, art advertising design at Leighton School of Art in Milwaukee. And he spent months researching the collection there. And I looked into the curriculum about what color pencils they're supposed to use. I looked into Faber-Castell pencils from the 30s and 40s. And what it narrowed down to after probably, we were maybe in two months out of the exhibit opening and I finally tracked down the kit for topographical draftsmen in the Army. And that kit includes colored pencils because the map makers had to use different colored pencils for the different plotting marks. And I knew this, but I didn't know it to the extent that when I finally found the kit and the, the number of pencils, it all made sense to me. All of his drawings made sense to me. What you see here is, well, let's see, is that the best example, Brittany? Maybe this one's the better example. I think that one. So in the kit, they would have your primary colors. So red, blue, yellow. They obviously would have black. I shouldn't say obviously. They had black and they had brown, uh, green, and yellow. I don't think orange was the color in the in the we found some orange leads, but the, but those colors, those five colors I just noted were what was in the kit. So red, blue, yellow, green, black, brown. That's what Harold had at his disposal was the most practical medium. And that's what these drawings were created with. So it's pretty spectacular when you think about the range of color and the range of atmosphere that he created with those five color pencils and the detail, I wish I would have had some documentation of him sharpening the pencil. The only part that I found was the Draftsman's Army Manual that teaches you how to properly sharpen uh, a lead for uh, rendering in maps, but in detail, because he had to constantly be sharpening his pencil to get this kind of line work uh, to be so crisp, especially in the lighthouse drawing. And the lighthouse drawing, I'm going to stop for a second just to double check. Is anybody, we can open it up for some questions right now if anybody has any questions. If not, no worries. We have plenty of time to, to we have plenty of content to give you guys some more behind the scenes. 
You seeing, are you seeing any, Eric? Yeah. yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I had a question from Michael Goodman. Uh, okay. He answered that. Um, as, as you were covering uh, your, the, the colored pencils. Okay. Um, we have another question uh, from Mike Olson as well. And he wants to know uh, if you had more time uh, with this exhibit, what do you think you might do next or expand upon or explore even further? I love that question. And I, and I promise you, we didn't plant that question. I, I wrote right before we started, um, Brittany and I have spent the last few days reviewing our notes because it's been a year since we were really, you know, in Harold Schmidt's land. And so we were wrapping our brains around all of this wonderful information. And in my notes today, I wrote, this could have become a map making exhibit. So how many questions were posed during our, the process of, I had, you guys can see, I don't have a problem talking or thinking these things through. Brittany's job, along with Kevin Hampton, our curator of history, was to pull me back and to like make me stop and say, we can't cover all of this in this. And if we start covering all these topics, we lose sight on the fact that this is about Harold Schmitz and his work. Because one of the things I really wanted to put in here was a show within a show. So because Harold was a graduate from the Leighton School of Art, uh, Charlotte Partridge, who was the director of Leighton School of Art, continued to exhibit, sell, and coordinate with artists who were students at Leighton School after they got drafted into the military and served overseas. And she was a creator of a, a traveling exhibit around the country called An Army at War that had professional uh, artists who were in the military on exhibit with their works from overseas and, and works that they would send back to her. And I really wanted to investigate that Leighton School of Art approach to Harold's roots. Um, but that started taking away from his story. So we really stepped back from that. And it, it proved invaluable research, but we realized that wasn't the time to exhibit that. So that prompted a little point for us to say, I'm going to put a pin in that. And that might be a completely other exhibit down the road, whether it's from the traveling art exhibit purview or from a another temporary exhibit, that's something we could consider without having to take away from Harold's work. And Harold could be included in that. Um, the other part of this was when we started really learning about the 955th and the topographical engineers and learning about what the map makers at that time were doing, uh, we found so much information about that process that we, I'm going to stop sharing for a minute. Um, we found so much information about that process that we knew we had a whole nother exhibit from a military standpoint that we could focus on. And that is from the techno technological advances of map making. Uh, we had I'm not, I'm not a historian. I have an art background, uh, an art history background. So unlike Chris Kolokowski, our director, and Kevin Hampton, our curator of history, who would have been reading about or presenting about the topographical engineers, the 13th Air Force, all of these military components during this time frame, a lot of this stuff would not have been new to them. This would not have been something that made them say, hey, I have to tell the story. But somebody from an art background uh, that was lo looking at learning Harold's military side, I was amazed by the newness of everything. The 13th Air Force was brand new. We had part of my uh, research went in, uh, was a, a book that the 13th Air Force put out. Uh, these, these units for map makers were, weren't exactly new, but they were new in the sense that this was the first time that people could make maps in the field in real time. They could make them in real time and they could update them in real time. So that created this wonderful expediency for mission, you know, for mission and operations. You could modify the maps after a campaign, an aerial campaign, a bombardment, and get them to 
uh, out to the, the troops to make the next steps in their mission possible. Uh, and at, if you know the history of the Pacific, which we've been covering in our blogs in the Victory in the Pacific 75 years later, what that means to all of these campaigns is I can't, I can't think of those campaigns being as successful without the capabilities that these map makers pro provided. Um, the, Brittany, I, I'm going to kind of toss it to you a little bit too about the newness of the map making and the research that we found in, in that. Uh, I, we're still on Michael's question about w what another exhibit would be, but I, I think that I found so much information valuable from that research that I really wanted to, to think about researching map makers and um, photogrammetry. So go ahead. I think in looking at what we would do if we had more time, we're both looking at back at what this exhibit has been as we've planned. So one of the things, one of my favorite exhibit layouts that we did was a timeline, a true timeline of when everything was drawn and when all the letters were written, and then the maps that Harold was making for his, his job. So looking at what he did in his free time, which were these beautiful drawings, and then the very precise maps that he did. And I don't know if we've covered it in here yet, but Harold did the lettering on all of these maps. Yeah, I can definitely pull up some of the tools while you're talking about that. Let me... Uh... And as we developed and put this exhibit together, Yvette um, gathered different things that they would have used to make these maps. And one of the things she gathered was a lettering kit. And I, I, I played with it to see how the lettering would go. You, you have a, a pen attached to a device and you trace the letter and then the, the pen that is, it's attached to draws the letter. I, I cannot imagine how hard that would be day in, day out to do on the maps that, he, that they were making and the volume at which they were making them. Yeah, and, and are you able to see the screen, Brittany, of the... All I see is the top of your Explorer screen. Okay, it did the same thing, so let me stop sharing. Um, so one of the things we considered there, can you see the photogrammetry now? Yep. Great. So as we started the research of the map making, one of the things that I really got interested in was a, an interpretive hands-on methodology to translate the experience of what Harold would actually be doing in this map making world. And part of it is we've become so accustomed to computer technology that we can't really fathom what it would mean to create uh, a map with such precision by hand uh, and to print in real time and what that meant. And, and I want to talk a little bit about what we're looking at, but before I do, I think we need to understand the process of map making is extensive. To make one map would have taken at least two weeks. So when I talk about Harold giving us clues to build this timeline for us of his experience, we use of course, the drawings with the dates, and then we used the letters with the dates, and then we were able to use maps that we found from the library in Australia that the 955th created with dates on them. What we noticed is at the very beginning in 42, when he first gets to New Caledonia, there's like 10 or 12 drawings right off the bat. There's all these drawings. Then Espiritu Santo, when they were building up the base, there were another series of drawings of them building the base out there. They weren't making maps yet. Then you get into the time where they're making maps and all of a sudden there's this big gap. There's no letters, there's no, there's no drawings, there's nothing. We just, for some reason are like, what happened during this period of time where we, we lose contact? And then when we finally found the maps from Australia, we realized here's the dates of the times we're missing. And it's because they were making maps. He didn't have time to be writing home. He didn't have time to be drawing. He, all he had time to do was make maps. And because of Harold's skill set, and also I think he was a really good art director. So I think he was given a level of senior abilities, even though his rank didn't show it, he was in charge of a team of the draftsmen, which they were in charge of the lettering. But the machine you're looking at right here 
is a photogrammetry. So on the left is we have something similar on exhibit in the in the exhibit. But what you see those two little fins that are on the right at an angle are mirrors. So they're like reflect their lenses. Like there's there's these there's two eyes that look down and then there's mirrors and it's all about lenses that looking down so that when you are looking at an image you can create this three-dimensional sort of I guess feeling of the photographs you're looking at. Uh, to the right is, I'm losing, it's a pantograph. So I researched some pantographs and what a pantograph does is it's connected through, you see that sort of triangular um, arms with hinges on it. It's connected to this machine where it would draw, but the pantograph enlarges it or makes it smaller. So it's a scale model. Uh, so if I'm drawing, let's say I'm drawing something that's two inches high and it's attached to a pantograph, that pantograph is going to scale it up precisely to uh, a larger or smaller entity. Brittany and I tried out a couple of these tools. The other tool was like the Leroy lettering kit. This book is something that shows you some of the tools they were using to document um, and to make maps. But there's a lot of math involved. You see the writing on this clear imagery is where they were marking locations that they had to um, translate into the two-dimensional map. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the science behind this because it just, I'm not qualified to do that, but this is some of the research we went into to think about it. This was another projector and printmaking component. Um, and this, this all could have been its own exhibit, just diving into the work they did. Exactly. But it looks like we have a question of what's next for Harold. What's next for Harold? Okay, well, uh, Harold is currently slotted to do a couple things. One is we will have a traveling banner exhibit. Uh, thanks to a, a sponsor that we got last year, we were going to have, uh, and I'll, I'll have Carlson remind me who provided us with the opportunity to do that. So we have traveling exhibits and we have traveling art exhibits. And the traveling exhibits uh, are the original fine artwork, and I'll get into that in a second. Or, I'm sorry, the traveling exhibits are banner exhibits. So we take these beautiful scanned images and we reproduce them on banners that can pop up and be taken down fairly easily. And those get distributed to libraries and different community centers around the state, sometimes schools. around the country, schools, uh, to be on temporary exhibit. So Harold will see, his work will see a new exhibit in life in that form. The original pieces will now be going back to our traveling art exhibit program, which is being redeveloped to consider exhibiting uh, other artists within our collection in a way that not only gets them out for people to see the original artwork, but also takes the time to make sure that we're protecting and preserving the artwork in a really responsible way. So that's something that we're looking at as we're developing this art program is, do we need to send entire collections out at one time? Or can we take it from each of our artists and rotate out in a way that the artwork gets out there, but we also know that it's not staying, it's not traveling and, and possibly causing harm to the, the artwork. So that's what my job is, is to spend uh, my time in the art exhibit world, considering how we continue to exhibit this artwork and make it available beyond the door, beyond our museum doors. So that's what's next for Harold. He hasn't seen the last light of day. Uh, but he will, the show is coming down this fall. We have a new exhibit coming up. Uh, it's called Souvenirs of Service, The Things They Kept. So that's a little teaser for you guys that uh, Harold's coming down. We do have another wonderful exhibit that's going up, but he, his, his story is not complete yet. We, we will continue to discuss Harold. I, I currently have three artists that I focus on in the, in the art exhibits. Harold Schmitz, Santos Zingali, and John Gaddis. So we have Civil War watercolors from John Gaddis, uh, these beautiful portrait work from Sailor and um, UW Emeritus, uh, Santos Zingali, and then of course the, the wonderful drawings of Harold Schmitz.
you, Bet. I was uh, curious if you could uh, maybe talk a little bit more about the book that you were just looking at that had the map making machines in it. Sure. Uh, Carol Barth would like to know what that book is. Sure. And Carol, that book, let me, um, let me share a screen again. That book is found online and I can, e I believe I have your email, Carol, but if you want to leave it in the chat, I will email you the link to this. This is a uh, public, let me go to the, the top page. Oh, I, before I forget, this, I wanted to show this picture. This is the uh, pantograph on a large scale on the floor. So all of those would be lined up to make line work. Um, it's the intricacies of this science is unbelievable. There's the sketch master, which is also on exhibit. Um, so this is the geological survey circular. You, I'm going to read it out loud, even though you guys can see it, but development of photogrammetry in the U.S. geological survey. And I was looking for time period publications so that uh, the information I was getting would have been uh, relevant to what Harold would have been using. Um, but I found this online. This was part of the research that I did uh, to study what Harold was doing. This is from 53, so it's a little bit more advanced than what Harold was using, but Harold and his colleagues were perfecting these mechanisms and really were writing, literally writing this book. Uh, but it has a ton of illustrations with the ma machinery they used and descriptions of how to use it. If you're interested in this type of machinery too, uh, all of the army manuals are online. So you can find, if you type in uh, army uh, training manual topographical draftsman, you should be able to find the training manuals, the TMs for army publications. And they're all in PDF form both downloadable and viewable in these wonderful for forms. Um, this is another one, practical applications of the stereo comp paragraph plotting machine. So if you look at what this person's doing, that's sort of the restrictive work that Harold and his colleagues would have had to do. We did have a guest speaker last year uh, that he came and spoke about photogrammetry and the evolution of map making from World War II to today. And that was probably one of my best, my favorite, my best, one of my favorite mess nights to go to uh, because he really broke it down for what these, what these men did uh, in, in this process, what these artists did. I mean, a lot of folks forget these guys were artists. These were at the, you know, they did drawings for advertising design for publication. Some of them, uh, you know, were more tech technical draftsmen, but for the most part, these were all visual artists in illustration, had to transform, transform those skill sets. And when you look up, if you take the time to look up the training manual, I will say that is another seed that Harold planted for us. He graduated from the Leighton School of Art. I was able to find all of the lesson plans and the curriculum for Leighton School while well, Harold attended in 1937. And what we looked at for advertising design, the lettering curriculum, when we held that up next to the training manual for topographical draftsmen and how to letter maps, it was almost identical. And uh, it was a two to three year curriculum. So when the military drafted these artists, they knew what they were doing. They knew they could expedite that curriculum so that they didn't have to spend the two to three years teaching the basics of drafting letters or printmaking. Um, they, they already had that skill set. All they had to do was translate it into map making. And when we say printmaking, Harold describes it in his oral history, it was these giant tractor trailers filled with equipment. All of this equipment had to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, this was all transferred to the Pacific and they, in the middle of the jungle, was set up and they did all of this in the field. And that was a first. All right, we have about five minutes left. Do you want to talk about his oral history or <laughs> the sketchbook? I think I like his oral history and, and, and I want to give you some, I, I talk too much, Brittany, you got you to gotta stop me sometimes. Um, 
I want to say thanks again to Linda. And I'm saying this as a way when people consider donating their family's collections, they often aren't sure what could be valuable to our collection. And the scrapbook, this is kind of a combo, Brittany, that scrapbook that we talked about at the very beginning, Harold put it together and then put it away, never to be talked about again. So sometime in the 40s, he put that scrapbook together, stored it away, and then however many years later, like 2012, 2013, Linda went and visited him with the scrapbook, and he hadn't really looked at it since the 40s. And she started talking to him about the drawings and had the, the mindset to say, maybe I should record this. And so the audio recording we have, we know it's not the best audio quality. It's from a telephone. But it was amazing the am amount of information we got from Harold just being able to walk us through these drawings. And it, it's like it, it finishes. He says, I can't believe I did these. He didn't even... You know, it was, they're so beautiful to think that they were sitting stored away in this book for so long. And by bringing them out for all of us to see and thinking about recording him talking about it, it was just so lovely. And between that oral history and the letters, I really felt like I was having a conversation with him. I don't know about, were you, Brittany? Did you feel the same way? That's how I tend to feel when I go through collections. I get, I have a very nosy job. I get to read people's letters and diaries that they don't think are ever going to see the light of day. Um, so I, I get to feel that way a lot. I'm very lucky, but it was important to both of us that we include his voice in the exhibit. So part of that was including parts of the letters that we had because those were important to understanding where he was uh, like mentally and talking to his friend back home, a colleague at Hammersmith Court Meyer you know, that, that friendship they had and asking her to send some sketchbooks so he could continue drawing. And it was a very sweet friendship that we know now eventually blossomed into a marriage and, you know, life together. But it was also important to hear him reflecting back and looking at his artwork and saying, I can't believe I did this. Yeah. And just the sheer skill and beauty of his drawings. And he's saying, I can't believe I did this. He was truly a skilled artist his whole life. He was, and he was a very humble man, too, and we learned that from, we were able to actually interview colleagues that he worked with in the 70s and gave an opportunity, uh, uh, you know, the, a woman he hired in 1977 ended up taking over as art director for him from Northwestern Publishing, and it told me a lot about him when she gave me a little background about the fact that he hired her and brought her on. Um, I do want to say, the letters were to Eleanor. Before we have to leave, though, the letters to Eleanor were a friendship and a colleague that developed into this wonderful um, relationship and a marriage. Uh, and they were able to talk about the behind the scenes of, you know, the creative process. Can you see this image, Brittany? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is from a contemporary advertising firm in the 40s. Uh, P and H. And I was able to find this in my research. And this is what an artist's view of life in an art studio. And I bring this up because Harold's letters between him and Eleanor L. At first were just him, her bringing a little bit of home back to him, talking about the ins and outs of H and K at the publishing and, and talking about the colleagues that they worked with. And these descript, descriptions of these, of these co-workers were that, that we learned each of their senses of humor and it was really amazing. And this drawing I found really captured a sense of how these artists at work will caricature each other. And I really loved that about these, these drawings. I was able to at least see a little of that humor that was contemporary, but also, you know, Harold had the skills uh, of many across the country and across the world. Um, I know we're running out of time. We're down to a minute. You've got um, two questions in the chat. Okay, go ahead. You've got, where were the maps actually printed? They were printed there in New, in Espiritu Santo, wherever the map makers were. The tractor trailers had the printing presses. They were um, the first offset printing presses, not the first, like not the first ever. They, they were... Um, printing presses in the field. And when I say offset lithograph, what I mean is there's this big metal drum 
and they had those when I showed the that picture of that mechanism that looked like a bunch of lights on a table uh, those were exposure units so it was a very photographic based system and each map each color has to have its own plate this is the way printing works so like the lines would have their own plate the water would have their own plate the letters would have their own plate and each of those had to be photographed then exposed to a piece of metal and then that metal would be wrapped around a drum and it would be inked up and sent through a printing press and you could do that multiple times to create the multiple. Um, it's a far more complicated process than that but um, it just goes to show the labor that had to go in that. So this was the first time they were able to, they didn't have to send information back home. That was still happening but they could actually print in real time. So it was printed out there and updated out there. What was the other question? What is the hardest thing about being a curator? Edits. <laughs> I think the research is the funnest part. The relationships are amazing. Um, the, I, I'm an artist, so the design process is my favorite thing. It gets me in trouble because I think visually and I, I think look before concept and sometimes that works really well and other times it gets you going down the wrong path. Um, but I think the hardest thing is knowing what you need to, what is relevant and what you need to cut. Because there's so much more that we didn't even get in the exhibit. And up until the last day, we were still like, do we take this, do I sacrifice this one piece? Um, and some, and when you realize, there were several parts of the exhibit that didn't make it in that most folks don't even know about. The development of, of, uh, Espiritu Santo by the Seabees and how the 955th helped with that. We had a whole case with the construction manual and the drawings that the 955th did to, to educate the Seabees on how to build a base. All the photographs, those were cut. Um, I think like a week before we opened, we cut that case. Yeah. So it's, it's all about trying to refine what you want people to understand and trying to detach yourself from something you might personally love a lot. The details about learning how to build a base and then making a manual in the field to be distributed out to the world. That was a really fun detail that we had to cut because it just, it just didn't fit anymore. Yeah. And we didn't have that. I know we're two minutes over. I just want to say there was, as an artist, this was something that was a very valuable lesson to bring in curators of objects versus curators of art. So uh, the curators of objects said, you can't just put objects for the sake of putting objects out there, right? We didn't have the right sort of construction tools that went with the topic. And so we found ourselves filling up space just for the sake of filling up space. And at that point, that's when you know cut it, right? The construction manual still made it onto exhibit, but that whole storyline wasn't necessary for the exhibit to evolve. And the end of the day, the answer was no. So even though I had a large scale reproduction of the drawing already printed, even though we already had the case out there, it's gone. And that's now in my office. So, hey. <laughs> Well, Brittany and Yvette, we'd like to thank you very much for lending your, uh, you know, your insights and your expertise on the how, you know, you developed this exhibit and the, and the certain obstacles um, and, and the information that you used and how you used it as it became available to you in setting this exhibit up. Um, as Yvette alluded to earlier, uh, we cannot wait for uh, the museum to open back up so people can come in and, and see this, uh, this fantastic exhibit before it comes down. Um, and then also uh, there is uh, possibly the opportunity, um, you know, to make an appointment uh, with our archivist and see uh, this material firsthand. Brittany's empathetically shaking her head yes, so I would encourage everybody to do that uh, once we start back opening back up to the public. Um, but once again, I would like to say thank you to Yvette and Brittany uh, for your time today. And of course, to everybody who showed up uh, for this discussion for their time as well today too. Uh, we certainly love putting these things on for everyone. Uh, and, you know, it just, it just gives us a little more uh, flavor to the museum, some things that you don't normally see uh, as you're going through the exhibit spaces. Um, and then lastly, again, thank you to the foundation, the Wisconsin Veterans Museum Foundation, uh, for their continued support in putting these programs on, uh, free of charge for our fantastic audiences out there. Um, we have a couple more events coming up in the, in the next few weeks. Uh, next Tuesday night, we will have our trivia event. 
Uh, and then also on the 27th of this month, we will have another curator's discussion. So please look on our website uh, for information uh, regarding those times and registration sites. <laughs> Um, and we look forward to seeing everybody back again uh, for our next discussion. Thank you so much for everybody showing up, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day.